and welcome to our panel on the development of a 3D HI ecosystem. I'd like to give our uh, panelists a chance to introduce themselves and their interest in 3D HI. Okay, my name is Mark Horowitz. I'm a faculty member at Stanford University. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've been there nearly forever. Um, uh, oh, I think it's close to 40 years. Um, so, and I've been an IC designer for a very long time. So my interest is really in this area is in design. I'm so old that I was an IC designer before ASICs actually existed, before there was an ASIC design technology, if you can imagine. Um, <clears throat> And one of, my, I, uh, one of my ideas right now is that we're in another transition very similar to the transition that happened in the 80s, where the whole way we conceptualize design needed to change to bring in a, a new class of designers into the silicon business. And at that time, it was basically logic designers or board level designers who were building with chips. And we had to bring them into the you know, chip design space. If I look at the interest in hardware design at the university today, you know, everybody's interested in applications and AI and machine learning, and as they should, because that's sort of where a lot of the interest in fast moving changes. I think, like before, we need to change who we are targeting as designers and try to attract those people who are interested in applications to become interested also in doing hardware level design. And I think heterogeneous integration is one of the vehicles that's going to enable us to do that. Um, and the reason it's going to be interesting for these people to do this is that their base level silicon processors are not going to increase in performance that rapidly moving forward because of various changing in the way technology and technology scaling. So they, I think, will have an impetus to try to think about other ways to improve their performance. And we need to capture them and, um, and enable them to take advantage of silicon technology. Thank you, Mark. Philip? Sure. I'm Philip Wong, professor at Stanford University. I'm not at Stanford as long, <laughs> as, long as Mark did. <laughs> <laughs> Spent 16 years at IBM Research in Yorktown Heights before I moved to Stanford. I've been there since 2004. Uh, I'm a device technology person. I work on device technology. And for the past 50 years, we're almost like walking inside a tunnel. That it's, we're on a two-dimensional miniaturization tunnel. Everything we do is to go towards shrinking the transistors, miniaturizing the transistors to, to, to derive all the benefits that we have. Uh, higher energy efficiency, higher device density, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're kind of at the exit of the tunnel, uh, which is you know, sometimes people interpret it as we're going to fall off the cliff. There's no more progress in device technology. That's one way to interpret it. The other way is to say, well, we're no longer confined by the tunnel. In the past, we know there's only one way to go. There's just strengthening the transistors. It's from, the, from a device technology point of view, it's kind of boring. Uh, we're at the exit of a tunnel. We can do a lot of things. At the exit of a the tunnel, there are many, many ways to go forward. And 3D integration is one of the many ways that, that we can go, go, to, go to. And in terms of 3D integration on the, from a device technology point of view, there are a couple of the interesting things that I had observation. One is, if you think about 3D chip stacking, 2.5D, 3D chip stacking, and so on, one of the key defining features is the number of connections, the number of connections between the chips uh, on the 2.5D on the side and number of connections between layers of the chip in, in the third dimension. And think about connection density in the vertical direction. Uh, today, if you talk about uh, chip stacking, you're talking about, depending on what, you, what technology you're focusing on, whether you're in a really mature product technology or whether you're in a, uh, development, a t development type technology, you're talking about tens of microns or even down to a micron and perhaps uh, for those who are working on more advanced technology, going slightly below a micron. And from a fundamental technology or physics point of view, there's no reason why chip stacking technology, vertical pitches, cannot, vertical connection densities, cannot go below pitches of, let's say, 100 nanometer or even tens of, na tens of nanometers. When you get down to that level, that 3D stacking is no different from the back end of a conventional monolithic chip. 
So there will be, I think, a continuum of connection densities from monolithic integration that we are, yeah, that we are familiar with today uh, to 3D chip stacking and 2.5D uh, packaging. So there is a tremendous opportunity for design innovation. How are you going to partition your system as, with the fact that there will be a continuum of inter interconnection density in the vertical direction that is similar to what you have in the two-dimensional plane. And today in the two-dimensional plane, you have a continuum of interconnection densities. And in the vertical direction, you will have that as well. So in other words, from a design point of view, we don't need to necessarily think of devices as existing in different layers. Devices can exist in all three dimensions arbitrarily. The key question is, how do we design such a system? How do we think about how to architect such a system? That's from an architectural point of view. From a device the technology point of view, once we're starting build to build things in 3D, what we require are device technology that can be fabricated at low temperatures and that can be wired up in three dimensions. Now, that requires new materials, new device technologies that we don't have today. The silicon technology that we have today requires very high te temperature, 1,000 degrees C's and so on. If you put 1,000 degrees C's with all the wires in place, your wires will melt and the insulation will break down. So new technologies, device technology in the third dimension will necessarily need to be made with materials that are, can be fabricated at low temperature. And so that requires a rather different way of thinking about choosing materials and synthesizing materials and putting materials together in the, in the third dimension. As it's gonna be a very disruptive if, uh, changes in the way we make devices. Now with that in mind, uh, those are the, that also bring a lot of opportunities. Uh, the opportunity being that you can choose device technology for specific things you wanna do. Very similar to the case of uh, architectural design, we are in architecture design, we are computer architecture, we are gone to domain specific architecture. Namely, we design accelerators to do a specific thing. And, and we compose the entire system by putting different accelerators together, orchestrated by some central processing unit and so on. Now in the device technology end, I envision that later on, when we go to really 3D heterogeneous integration, there will be a variety of different device technology that do things very specific for a very specific function. Some may be high performance, some may be extremely low power, some may do very RF, some may do a different thing, and we will be able to compose all these together heterogeneously, either in a monolithic sense, or in a 3D package sense, or in a 2.5D package sense. So what I would call this kind of 3D system, situation of what I call 3D mosaic, monolithic, stacked, assembled IC. So that's what I think going forward. And there's a wonderful opportunity for all of us to come up with device technology and the way to design things, and also an ecosystem to design this. I think other panelists will talk about that as well. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. Bill? My name is Bill Phillips. I'm director of the Advanced Missions Group at Northrop Grumman. Uh, what, and I've also been there a long time. Um, what uh, I'm primarily interested in is the development of advanced uh, defense electronics and uh, sensor systems. We're primarily a sensor house, so um, think radar, uh, electronic warfare, uh, communication systems. So uh, my job in the organization is to develop the next generation of those systems and you know, as they become more flexible, more programmable, multifunction systems where we combine um, all those functionalities into a single system. Um, previously, I was director of advanced technology um, for the sector, and uh, there I developed a lot of advanced um, electronics, um, a number of MTO programs, including uh, the Arrays of Commercial Time Scales program, the Yellowfin program, Midas, um, a few of those. So I kind of uh, previously was the developer of uh, high density electronics. Uh, now my role is more in the application of those. Um, those electronics into uh, next generation systems. Um, my main interest in 3DHI is just uh, as systems, can, I guess two areas really, um, miniature systems, somebody mentioned earlier today, 
uh, unmanned, large numbers of unmanned uh, aircraft that are relatively small, low power, um, being able to miniaturize systems, uh, next generation defense sensors, and put those into uh, miniature platforms. And then also um, for more traditional platforms, continuing the, uh, the integration of more capability into our sensor systems. Um, so that's really my role and, and my interest. Thanks, Bill. Uh, the ability to integrate a diversity of materials and technologies in the 3D HI stack is essential to realizing the full potential of what you can achieve with 3D HI. What technologies uh, do you think are important to think about including uh, in a 3D HI microsystem beyond silicon CMOS? Well, but maybe I'll start from here. Um, yeah, well, there will be a diversity of technology. Uh, silicon CMOS is more or less like a general purpose thing. You can do a, a variety of uh, things with it, and, but it doesn't do some of these very specific things really well. And today, we, uh, let me take an analogy. We are more, more or less like driving an 18-wheeler truck every day to go, go shopping, pick up my kids, from school and so on, because I expect one day I will need this 18 wheeler truck to move my home from New York to California. <laughs> and that is not very efficient, right? So we probably going forward, we need to go beyond that and pick device technologies that can do very specific, specific things and integrate and spend time to integrate things together. So in the past, our, most of our fabrication and manufacturing uh, technology are focused on improving uh, dimensional resolution, precisions, and so on. And going forward, we need to develop technology that could integrate things together, uh, integrate very complex technology together. And because there are very complex integration of chips together or different device layers in the 3D stack, we really need to develop process technology that has very fast cycle time, very short cycle time. Because comp process is very complex. If the cycle time is long, then it takes like three months, six months, nine months to build a chip, and nobody wants that. So you really need to think very differently going forward. I think in, in development of our advanced sensor systems, um, you know, we, well, first of all, we, you know, we certainly like Silicon CMOS, and we're excited to be starting on the Ramp C program and doing some of our first 18A designs now. Um, and, and we have a processing um, product line that will use, you, you know, be primarily silicon. But the, Mark Rosker mentioned earlier um, phased array antennas or active electronically scanned arrays, um, AESAs. Uh, that's probably the, the biggest driver for high density um, packaging in our product line. And in those situations, we really need gallium nitride, gallium arsenide, so we need the 3-5 semiconductors um, along with silicon germanium by CMOS. So we need to bring higher power devices um, by CMOS together um, with silicon CMOS to build the types of systems you want. And I'd say the phase array antenna is a key driver for us. And many of the um, high density packages we built over the last few years, both 3D and 2.5D, um, have been driven by the uh, by next gen AESAs. Yeah, I, I would just say that um, when we talk about silicon, silicon covers a very broad range of things. So there's been some technology, you know, a silicon based technology, but it's really for photonic um, circuits. Yeah. Um, it's a different silicon than most people would use for their their you know, computing. So you need to have some of that. And then there's all the PMIX that you have every place, which are the power, you know, things that generate the power. That also, sometimes gallium nitride, but sometimes silicon. But that's, again, a different technology. And I think, at least in the nearer term, it's the integration of many different technologies, as Philip said, um, optimized for particular applications that we'll be able to put in that will really be enabling. I mean, if you're gonna do kilowatt you know, things, you can't distribute that. You have to actually have the PMIX under it. You know, there's a whole bunch of issues that I think this will solve. Certainly, thank you. Um, so one of the things DARPA is working towards is creating larger access uh, to a 3D infrastructure uh, and ecosystem. Uh, this could be compared to the way MOSIS uh, increased access uh, 
years ago. Um, how do you think, what are, what are the biggest uh, challenges that need to be overcome to uh, open this access up? Well, I, I think the thing that we need to realize is that we're burdened by our own success. I mean, the kind and capabilities of systems that we expect to be able to create are just fabulous because, you know, we get devices that have fabulous capabilities. Those things are incredibly complicated. And I think one of the big issues to enable, enable people to take advantage of the technology is provide base platforms of various kinds onto which you can add your widget that you build. Because what we want to enable is teams of students or small advanced research teams to be able to partake and do the cutting edge research to push things forward. And you know, we want to enable people trying crazy ideas, but crazy ideas are generally crazy and don't work. So if, you know, if it's a $100 million crazy idea, you don't get too many of those. But if we have platforms on which we can attach our new sensor technology, our new accelerator, I think we can enable many people to come in. And, and we need to think about how to enable those platforms and what is that software interface. You know, the way you're going to plug it in, it's not just what the IOs are, but how the whole thing's going to connect together. I think if we define that at a higher level, then we can enable this and we'll have a, you know, a place that can do separate fabrication of the magical chip that you're doing in, what, in the new technology, but then attach it to a base platform. Might not be the platform you really want, but it will enable you to do the prototype relatively quickly, and I think that's what we're really trying to do. I totally agree with Mark that we need to make things very simple. Uh, the way the uh, industry ecosystem today in advanced packaging is that everything is custom. There's no such thing as what, what Mark just described. And everything is custom designed and because uh, you, the, the people who are doing the advanced packaging are satisfying customers with really huge volume. And only customers with really huge volume can afford it. And so people who are trying new things have zero volume, basically, right? So <laughs> there's, there's no way to get in. Um, now, if you think about uh, a step back and how we do digital design today, it is composed of standard cells and stuff like that, right? And if you think back many, many years ago, we didn't have standard cells, we custom lay out everything. And of course, it doesn't work that well if we want to go to a larger system, you want to experiment with things. And uh, of course, you give up something by having standard cells, but not much. And, uh, and I think you need to get the same point in this uh, 3D IC design and you get to a point where you standardize things, even though you may not get to the ultimate performance, it is a way for us to experiment things and try things out, and you'll get a lot of benefits other than just optimizing everything very, very closely. And we need to get that access to innovators, big companies, small companies, university researchers, in order to move this field forward. Yeah, I also agree with what Mark said. Chip design is extremely complex. I think they said it's the most complicated things that we've ever built. So I agree with Mark kind of taking some of the work out of it by getting some common base layers would be, would be a great idea. Um, one of the things I worry about with a, a 3DHI type capability in MOSIS is scheduling. And if we're going to have um, multiple materials at multiple foundries, now it becomes a, a job of trying to coordinate and align schedules. Um, at, at multiple foundries, and I think that that will be a challenge and how it will impact our schedules because there will still be some custom devices in most of these solutions, and, um, and scheduling will be a challenge. The other thing, um, I think MOSIS today and uh, in most of the MPWs we use today, we get back on untested dye, so uh, there needs to be a plan for how we'll, we'll get tested known good dye because we need a good dye mm -hmm. before we construct the 3D assembly. So I think there are some challenges with um, MOSIS has been a great success and I think one of the great success stories and just multi-project wafers in general have been a great way to drive costs down for development and prototyping. Um, it's going to be much more complex to do something similar um, in the 3DHI area. Thanks. Um, so uh, as you you have all alluded to um, the 3D HI ecosystem will involve sourcing chips from multiple vendors, um, and in these chips will be uh, IP. Um, 
What do you see as the challenges from integrating these chips from different sources and dealing uh, with IP challenges? Well, <clears throat> anybody who's um, gotten IP from different vendors and tried to put the different IP blocks together, uh, I think has found out that unless somebody else has done that before, um, it's a lot of work. Uh, because the IP specs are hard to understand and they're complicated and they don't always do exactly mm -hmm. what you thought they were gonna do. So, so that's one of the reasons I think that if we want to enable rapid development cycles, we need to have bunches of IP already put together in some pre-tested thing with the software drivers of all that IP working. Mm -hmm. um, and that you're gonna add something a little bit to that system. Uh, I talk about this as an app store for hardware because when we want to, to enable lots of software development for, for phone, we created an, an open interface that many programmers could program to. Like, they didn't know what was the other part of the system, but they could add their thing to the system. And so I think in hardware we need to do that. I don't think we're gonna successfully make it cheap to take a bunch of different IP blocks, put it together, because then you're building a complicated systems, and complicated systems are complicated. <laughs> and they take a lot of people <laughs> to make work. So uh, again, I think we need to enable people to basically push frontiers. Um, and then, <clears throat> once you push the frontier, someone's gonna build a system with some of that in it, and other people can then take advantage of it. From a device technology point of view, we, we do have to find a way to describe the technology. Uh, all the packaging technology, how the physical characteristics, uh, electrical, thermal, mechanical, and so on. We need to have a standardized way to describe the technology so that uh, the information you get from Foundry A and Foundry B are comparable or can be cross-checked and, 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 and uh, used uh, together in conjunction. So today, this is, these things don't exist. Uh, the industry is trying to develop things like UCIE, uh, TSMC has uh, 3D blocks, uh, which is a kind of like a, a way to describe the technology. Uh, so these things are kind of brewing right now, it's uh, evolving right now, it's not mature, but I think over time, people will realize that developing those uh, standardized way to describe very, very much like a PDK for a technology would be essential for us to uh, broadly use the 3D HI technology. I think standard interfaces are critical and I think you know we made good progress with things like the UCIE um, spec for digital interfaces. Again moving to um, mixed signal types of assemblies where we have analog and RF interfaces between chips I don't think there's a similar standard being developed for any of those um, um, analog systems. Uh, mixed signal, as I said earlier, many of our products are mixed signal in nature, so some type of analog uh, interface standard will be critical. I think the other thing is um, you know, the EDA vendors uh, uh, have some challenges. How do we um, support um, our designers and help them with these uh, very complex um, uh, assemblies? How do we design them? Uh, verification is really important. I think the progress in verification with the um, uh, that we've made over the last decade um, with uh, not only the verification methodologies but then with the, uh, the types of accelerators that many people are building where we can verify chips um, and be very confident now that we have first pass success on our silicon digital chips with uh, you know we're running um, full software um, applications in simulation before we ever tape out the chip. Um, it it's really is amazing what's being done today. We need to get that same level of verification with the 3D assemblies, and I think that comes with a lot of additional challenges uh, for um, the EDA community to, to support our designers. Thanks. So we've talked a lot about uh, the interconnection and that electrical interface between the chips. Um, I think we all realize that there's also thermal management and power distribution, and these will be fairly complex uh, microsystems, very complex microsystems. How would you foresee being able to design in that thermal management, the power distribution into uh, these microsystems? Well, <clears throat> I, I think today, 
all of these issues are basically being done for each of the new systems. And it takes a lot of design resources and expertise mm -hmm. to do this. Um, I, I believe that if we're going to make these systems easier to design, we're going to have to regularize many of these issues. <clears throat> so, you know, many of the designers might not know about thermal throttling. They might not know about power domains. They might not know about some cooling and thermal things. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the design tools are going to have to put in the temperature monitors in the various pieces of the silicon. We'll have to have some software routines that are already noticing about thermal controls because we need to automate this because if we don't automate it, then we're going to need those expertise on all of our teams. And, you know, at least at a university, our teams are not that large. Um, and they, unfortunately, once they learn something, they leave. Um, they graduate. Um, so we need to be able to maintain some design information within the tooling. That doesn't exist today, but I think some of the understandings that we have about how to do it give us the facility to, to build those tools, but that, that's the only way I think it's gonna happen in moving forward. Yeah, I totally agree with Mark. Uh, I don't have much to add uh, other than saying that uh, we really need to in include all these other considerations that traditionally were not included in today's EDA tools, and that needs to be done. Yeah, I think it's fundamentally it's a multi-physics type of uh, design that we have to have, and, and again, you know, it, it's going to fall to uh, uh, the EDA community to create the right types of tools that we need to uh, support that multi-physics design and, uh, and simulation environment. Yep. It sounds like we're talking about EDA tools and design tools that are, have a larger reach than what they currently do today. A, a PDK mm -hmm. that uh, includes more aspects of the, the chips. Yeah, just from a historical perspective, it used to be a chip designer would basically worry about the wire loads and the sizing, and we did work on sizing transistors and the custom and then sizing gates and everything like that. And over time, the place and route and the timing driven, driven place and route have done a lot of that work for us. And so that knowledge of how to handle those things have been embedded into the tools. Um, and now the tools do some power domain stuff, not all of it, but some of it, and there are flows for doing power domains. You know, the thermal, thermal issues and stuff like that are still not usually done. I mean, that's, it's done by tools, separate set of tools. IR analysis is a separate set of tools. Um, and when you think about the more complicated 3D integrated structures that we're talking about, those analysis are going to get much more complicated and power distribution is going to get much more complicated. Um, and I think we're going to do it by both having better analysis tools and regularizing how we do some of the design, like forcing certain decrees to happen to allow the tools to be able to do it. I mean, just extracting heat out of these stacks, if we're really going to run the stacks, all out is going to require maybe new technologies. You know, people have done fluidic channels at various times. Maybe we'll actually do that, but you know, there'll be lots of issues that we have to, have to address. Thank, thank you all for sharing your insights today. Um, I'd like to end the panel with um, allowing you to talk a little bit about what um, is the the applications of 3D HI that you're you're most excited to see turn into reality. I think, I think for us, um, I mentioned earlier the, the phased array antennas. That really is, um, if you think about defense, um, electronics, and sensing, the key technology that enables long range sensing um, or long range uh, electronic attack effects or long range directional communications is the phased array antenna. Uh, that's the application that has probably my, you know, most of my attention and where we've been driven. Um, to real challenges in terms of the density of um, IC packaging in those products. So I would say that's number one. Um, number two is secure processing. So again, you know, we're, we're starting to do our first 18A designs now, um, as, as Pat mentioned um, earlier. Um, in terms of um, secure processing, uh, that's the other application where, you know, we don't intend to design everything with, with the 18A node, um, mixing different um, nodes um, into those products as well. So that's kind of the two that are driving, uh, getting most of our attention in my organization right now. Thanks, Bill. 
Well, to me, the, the most interesting thing is in the, in the high performance computing space. Uh, uh, today, in the, uh, all the, comp the compute unit and the memory units are kind of separate. You, you have HBM you know, on a separate chip, integrated in a 2.5D with the, with the GPU and so on. But you can actually see that it, new opportunities can be had by merging and mixing all these, inter, all these memory technology and compute technology together in various ways, various combinations, various connection densities in, in, in various combinations. And how you can optimally design a system, a high performance computing system with, a, with the correct mix of memory technology and compute technology, that's really exciting opportunity going forward. And for me, the most exciting opportunity is to have the ability for a student in a class to actually build the chip, connect it, a chiplet, mm -hmm. connect it to a base system, and then have that base system really do something useful that they use. Because uh, today, it's very hard to build useful systems because of the complexity. But if we could attach it to a, a system, you know, you could customize your laptop or do something that I think would just be you know, awesome. It would be very fun. Thank you all, and. Uh...